he came back and he's like, Mom, listen, I know I'm blind, but like, I didn't see her up there. And then it instantaneously hit me, sheer panic. Even the worst of us can make progress. Even the ones that have been through hell and back can still make it. Everybody's yelling. We all is mad. I had to pop from her. This when she had grabbed and I kind of turned like he said, get back. But she didn't keep doing it. What makes a teenager snap and suddenly turn into a violent killer with no remorse? Is it something in their brain chemistry, a type of mental illness, or are they just born evil? We may never truly know what drives a teen to kill, especially when they have no real motive. The following stories tell the tale of teenage killers who murdered for no other reason than just because they wanted to. So you don't want to talk to us? I told y'all what happened, but I can't really tell y'all anymore because I don't really know what happened. Aiden Fucci is probably one of the top most hated teens in the whole world. This is because of not only the horrific things he did to an innocent girl and the lives he destroyed as a result, but because of how he behaved after brutally snuffing out a life in such a cruel way. This story takes place in the spring of 2021 in St. Johns County, Florida. It was there that Tristan Bailey, a beautiful 13-year-old middle school student and cheerleader, lived with her family. As the youngest out of five siblings, Tristan was the baby of the family. She was known for being energetic, popular, and a very good friend. Tragically, her life was cut short for no reason at the hands of her 13-year-old classmate, Aiden. It was in the morning of Mother's Day on May 9th of 2021, and Tristan's family was getting ready to start the celebration. I walked out and Sophia was making breakfast by herself, and I was like, where's Tristan? And she's like, she's still sleeping. And then my son came downstairs. I asked him to go upstairs and to wake up Tristan for breakfast. Tristan's older brother went into her bedroom to wake her up, but discovered that she wasn't there. Then he's like, Mom, listen, I know I'm blind, but like, I didn't see her up there. And then it instantaneously hit me sheer panic. Where could Tristan have gone? It was not like her to just leave and not tell anyone. Surely this meant that something was very wrong. I ran upstairs and went to her room and she wasn't there. I went to the bathroom. I went to our TV room upstairs. She wasn't there. Everyone just started running to every single room. I ran outside and called the police and our nightmare started. She was reported as missing a short time later, causing great worry throughout the community. What her family had not known was that really early that same morning, at approximately 1.45 a.m., Aiden had texted Tristan after getting her number from a mutual friend. Aiden was not someone who she knew well. He had just come to our school. It was not a name that we ever heard in her circle of friends, and they only had one class together. According to the teachers, they didn't even speak to each other in class. Aiden convinced her to leave the house and come up and walk with him in a secluded area. The two were captured on video surveillance, walking by a short time later. Newly released video by prosecutors shows what they say are the last moments of local teenager Tristan Bailey's life. Investigators say this is Tristan, 13-year-old Tristan walking with her accused killer, 14-year-old Aiden Fucci. When he managed to get Tristan to an area where he believed nobody was looking, he took out a sharp object and brutally attacked her. He struck her over and over, again and again, more than 100 times. He then left her body in a wooded area and ran away. Hours later, after Tristan had been reported as missing, everyone was checking their ring cameras and security footage to see if there were any signs of her. That's when a neighbor saw Tristan and Aiden walking by on their security footage from the night before. They also saw Aiden on the security footage again hours later, but this time he was alone and he was running while carrying a pair of shoes. Obviously, this made Aiden look super suspicious, so the security footage was handed over to law enforcement and Aiden and his friend the one who gave him Tristan's phone number, were later picked up by the cops and brought in for questioning. This video is a Snapchat that Aiden took while he was waiting in the back of a cop car. Fun. In a cop car. Yep. There is a girl missing and Aiden is acting like the whole thing is a big joke. 
but he won't be laughing for long. After he is brought into the station, Aiden's parents are called and informed about where their son is and what he is possibly being suspected of. When they came in, they were clearly about to panic. At this point, the news had broken that Aiden was a possible suspect and things were looking very, very bad. Uh, Snapchat, you get his number is more than that. How many people in the front of house that in our car stop? Because of that Snapchat thing you did. It's all over, you're all over the internet and everywhere. It's social media. It is on social media. The product comes stable and we have to get done with this. Just for your well safe being. They told Aiden that he needed to take this very seriously and tell them if he had anything to do at all with Tristan's disappearance. It's very serious. This is no joke. This is your whole life. Your whole life. Your whole life. And ours. And ours. And your brothers and sisters. And don't forget to go to school alone. Because the kids will help you. Aiden's parents were struggling to get any information out of him. When he did answer their questions, he would only do so with a few words. He didn't seem to care at all about what was going on. It's very important. It's all on you right now. It is my problem. You were the last, was the last one, one seen with her. So right now, it's a lot of it's facing you right now, son. So however you talk, you breathe, you think. Then you respond. But all Aiden did was shrug his shoulders. You know, I think it gave a lot of insight into his character and who he is. His whole attitude was very nonchalant. You're 14 years old and this is your classmate and your friend and you were with her last night. Eventually, Aiden made up a lie and claimed that it was Tristan who came on to him. Did you uh, kiss or do anything with this girl? Be honest as you can. Yeah, I kissed her. Any further? Mm -mm. <laughs> so your DNA is going to be on her? It wouldn't be long until the real story came out because a short time after, a neighbor who had been walking nearby made a very disturbing discovery. Mr. Hart, can you tell me what's going on today? So I heard there was a missing girl. We see the whole neighborhood's been a buzz. People have been looking forward. The sheriffs have been around, helicopters flying. My wife had mentioned maybe checking in the woods over here along the end of the cul-de-sac. The neighbor had wanted to be helpful by taking a look around, but he didn't actually expect to find anything. He definitely didn't expect what he would end up stumbling upon, which was Tristan's brutally battered body lying on the ground. I finished my run and I walked around through the woods and I just a last sweep. And when I came out of the fence at the southern end of the pond, I saw a dead girl there. As soon as I saw her, I stopped and called them. The sheer amount of wounds that covered Tristan's body was shocking. This seemed to have been done by someone who was filled with super intense rage and hatred. Wounds were defensive wounds, so she put up a fight. She fought back. It was a bloody awful crime scene. They did not find a murder weapon at the crime scene. There's a lot in the scene. Essentially, um, it was her and some of her personal items and effects, her vape and her cell phone and jewelry and I think some money there on the ground. Law enforcement now had to give Tristan's parents the worst news that they would ever receive in their entire lives. Their beloved daughter was gone. I actually was in the front yard and I had a lot of my friends surrounding me, but I remember the police walking up to me and telling me that I needed to go inside with them. Begged him not to take me inside. I remember collapsing in my front yard, pleading for them not to tell me what I knew was coming. Meanwhile, investigators had gotten a warrant to search Aiden's home. It was there that they found a blade with the tip missing and bloody clothes that had both Tristan and Aiden's DNA on them. A short time later, Aiden was officially charged with Tristan's murder. Let me tell you what you are charged with. You have been indicted by the St. John's County Grand Jury on the charge of first degree premeditated murder. That is a capital felony that is normally uh, punishable by up to death or life imprisonment. The fact that Aiden was only 14 years old at the time of the murder meant that he could not be sentenced to give up his life for what he did. But he would, however, face the next most severe punishment possible. In your case, because you are not yet 18 years old, death is not a possible sentence pursuant to the Florida and United States Supreme Courts 
but this charge does carry a maximum penalty of life imprisonment. In order to avoid what was sure to be an incredibly horrific and painful trial for everyone involved, Aiden had the option to plead guilty, and that's what he ended up doing. He was sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole. There are so many disturbing things about this case, but one thing that is especially strange is that Aiden admitted he never had a reason for killing Tristan. He didn't kill her because of greed or anger or any anything like that. It was done for no other reason than to satisfy this defendant's internal desire to feel what it was like to kill someone. There is only one appropriate sentence in this case. In March of 2023, Aiden would finally learn his fate. Mr. Fucci, having entered a plea of guilty to the crime of first degree murder, I adjudicate you guilty of the premeded first degree murder of Tristan Bailey. I sentence you to life in prison, eligible for a review of the sentence in 25 years. Aiden's mother, Crystal Lane Smith, ended up also being charged and convicted in this case. This was after she attempted to wash Tristan's blood out of Aiden's clothes after the murder in order to try to keep him out of trouble. This was considered tampering with evidence in a murder case and she was sentenced to 30 days behind bars and five years of probation because of it. As for Tristan's family, there is a huge hole in their hearts. Tristan should still be here. There was no motive. He just wanted to do it. And I think that's one of the most difficult parts um, for us. It's, there's nothing she did. There was no reason for the crime. He just wanted to kill somebody. How do you ever go about coming to terms with a senseless murder like this? And then there's the fact that it is possible that one day the person who killed Tristan could be free. It's hard to equate it with the feeling. A lot of people ask us if there's any sense of closure and just given the age at the time, 25 years, it's going to be reviewed. As a family, we're going to have to endure what possibly could come up again. Sixteen-year-old Jasmaya and Tasmaya Whitehead seemed like model high school students. They were hardworking, got good grades, and were even devoted Girl Scouts. But they had a very rocky relationship with their mother, Nikki Whitehead. It's difficult for them to start hearing and accepting, you know, the word no. As Nikki became more stern, um, that's just something that they couldn't they couldn't get used to. Nikki and the twins were constantly fighting. This isn't necessarily uncommon for 16-year-old girls and their mom to do, but with the Whiteheads, it reached a completely different level. On January 13th of 2013, Jasmaya and Tasmaya got into a particularly nasty fight with their mom before school. One thing led to another, and the twins ended up brutally killing their own mom and then going to school as if nothing had happened. Later that day, Nikki's body was found in the bathroom of the family home. It had been determined that Nikki had been killed and it was called a crime of passion. In other words, it was believed that she had been killed by someone who she knew very well. Jismaya and Tesmaya claimed that they had just come home from school like usual and that's when they discovered that something terrible had happened to their mother. The twins were brought to the local station so that they could be interviewed by detectives. While on the way to the headquarters, one of the officers caught one of the girls doing something strange in the back seat. The twins, uh, uh, we observed in the back of the ambulance, we saw her um, bite her arm. Uh, we stopped her and asked her, hey, what are you doing? And she explained that she does that when she gets um, upset. While it might not have made a lot of sense at the time, it is likely that the girls were trying to give themselves wounds to make it look like they were victims. If there was one thing about these girls, it's that they may be murderers, but they definitely know how to act. By the time they were brought in to be questioned by the detectives, they had already come up with their cover story and rehearsed it well. They were completely prepared and put on a pretty convincing innocent act. They pretended to be just a couple of scared young girls who had no idea what was going on. The girls cried for their mother, even though they were well aware that she was dead. It was some pretty bizarre behavior. Two girls were, you know, hugging each other and in each other's arms. Uh, and when I said, you know, what can I do to make this easier for you? 
They turned and looked at me and they said, can we watch CSI? So they just went from crying about their dead mom to wanting to watch TV in a matter of minutes. Something wasn't adding up. And immediately, the hairs on the back of my neck stood straight up. Essentially, it was right then and it was like, okay, this is something was very, very off. As convincing as these girls thought they had been, it wasn't enough for them to fool the detectives who had already been looking at the evidence and began to suspect them. The girls had a history of violent incidents involving their mother and had both been in counseling and juvenile court because of it. Jesmaya and Tismaya could tell that the detectives weren't buying the whole innocent act the way that they thought that they would. This seemed to worry them and they pointed out to the detectives that it was beginning to seem like everyone was accusing them of their mom's murder. Why didn't it, it seem like it? Who, who did it? And sure enough, they were right. Law enforcement did believe that they had done it. They were just waiting on a little bit more evidence to prove it. Once Jasmaya and Tasmaya seemed to realize that their initial plan wasn't working and that they could be looking at some pretty serious time behind bars, they changed up their story. They said that they had gotten into a fight with their mom, but it wasn't like an ordinary street fight. It wasn't like it was a fight on the street. It was more of a fight the teen said that during the fight, their mom had grabbed a heavy pot and threatened them with it. This caused things to escalate even further as they began to throw punches and try to wrestle a deadly weapon out of their mom's hand. Everybody's yelling. We all is mad. I had to pop from her. It is what she had grabbed and I kind of turned like and said, get back. But she didn't keep the mic in her hand. After a DNA test confirmed the bite marks found on Nikki's body were made by the twins, both girls were arrested and charged with murder. They initially pleaded not guilty. Later on though, they ended up taking a plea deal and pleading guilty to voluntary manslaughter. This was a less serious charge which earned them 30 years behind bars. But because of their age and the fact that they were minors when the crime was committed, they were given a chance at one day getting parole. So they could both be looking at the possibility of parole between the years of 2025 and 2027. But do they really deserve the chance to experience freedom again after what they did to their own mother? Officials say that the end of Nikki's life was unimaginably horrific. They had fought for her life. You know that her last few moments of life had to be uh, horrible. That she was being murdered by her own daughters, twin daughters, uh, and that she fought for her life and lost. As a judge hears arguments to decide if a teen who went on a shooting spree and murdered his family should be sentenced as an adult, we learn more about why he claims he did it in the first place. This last case is nothing short of horrific, and it involves the murder of not just one person, but five different people. And the whole thing was carried out by one very twisted teenage boy, Nehemiah Greggio. Nehemiah was born in Albuquerque, New Mexico in 1997 to a large family. He was one of seven children and came from a good background. His family and his community all had high hopes for Nehemiah, who planned to go to the army just like his dad, Greg. Greg was a convert to Christianity and served as a pastor at the Calvary Chapel in their community. He was well respected and religious, but he hadn't always been that way. When Greg was younger, he got into a lot of trouble and got involved with drugs. This led him to spend some time behind bars, but once he was out of prison, he was determined to turn his life around. He dedicated himself to God and started going to church again. One person who played a very important role in Greg's conversion to the faith was his wife, Sarah, Nehemiah's mother. Sarah was a very faithful woman who had taught her seven children about God and had spent a lot of her free time volunteering and helping others. So clearly the Greggios seemed like a very good, caring family. But according to Nehemiah, his parents weren't everything they seemed to be. They expected a lot from their children and supposedly kept them on a very tight schedule. As Nehemiah became a teenager, he started to resent his parents and their strict rules. He became very rebellious. He didn't want to follow the rules and he didn't want to do his schoolwork. To many, this probably seemed like just a normal teenage phase. Vanessa Lightborn, Nehemiah's older sister, said that he was always a difficult kid who didn't want to listen to the rules, but she never would have expected him to become a mass murderer. After all, lots of teens go through rebellious years, but then later turn out to be just fine. The 
this just wasn't the case for this teen. She also explained that when his mom attempted to homeschool him, he would never want to do any work. He was just always kind of a jerk, especially towards me and my mom. Um, he would just always call us names all the time, and he would curse at us. But tragically for Nehemiah, it was something much deeper and much darker than its simple phase. On January 9th of 2013, when Nehemiah was 15 years old, his mom got into a huge fight and she sent him to bed early. For hours, Nehemiah lay in bed tossing and turning while getting more and more angry. Eventually, his rage took over and he decided to do something incredibly horrific. He snuck out of his bedroom and down the hall to his parents' room, where he quietly went to where they kept their firearm and took it out. He aimed the weapon at his mom and fired it killing her instantly. Zephaniah woke up confused and scared. Nehemiah told him that he had killed their mom. He then showed his little brother, his mother lying in the bed, dead. When Zephaniah saw, he began screaming and crying. So Nehemiah pointed the weapon at him and killed him too. Next, Nehemiah walked across the hall where his little sisters, Angelina and Yael were. The little girls had been woken up by all the noise and were terrified. Without even a second thought, Nehemiah heartlessly killed them both. What he did next is particularly disturbing and shows what a true monster he is. Nehemiah went to the bedroom where his mother and brother lay dead in bed. He used his phone to snap a picture of his mom's dead body and sent it to his girlfriend. He told her that his mom was killed in an accident. After that, he went back to his little sister's room and fired at them again and again so he could be extra sure they were dead. After brutally murdering everybody in the house, Nehemiah grabbed his weapon and went downstairs to wait for his dad to come home. It took five hours for Greg to come home because he had been volunteering at a local homeless shelter on the night shift. When he finally came and walked in the door, Nehemiah killed him before he could even process what was happening. This killer teen had plans to go to the nearest Walmart and kill as many people as he could there, but by the next morning he was apparently so overcome with guilt that he couldn't follow through with it. He ended up going to his family's church and speaking to the pastor there. The pastor was actually a retired cop and he had a gut feeling based on how Nehemiah was talking, that he had done something really, really bad. He called 911, and not long after, the five bodies were discovered, and Nehemiah was arrested and charged with his family's murders. It was a horrific crime that shocked the entire community. About a week away from the three-year anniversary of the night Nehemiah Griego admits he shot and killed his parents and three younger siblings, the teen appeared in juvenile court today. He's 18 now, but he was 15 at the time of the murders, and a judge has asked us not to show his face. That judge will decide if Griego should be punished as an adult, which could mean life in prison. Originally, the judge had ordered the brain scans to be conducted to determine if Nehemiah was mentally stable. The court later ruled that it was possible for the teen to be rehabilitated and ordered that he be released on his 21st birthday. Obviously, this was a pretty shocking decision. It's not very often you hear of a person murdering their whole family and then going free after a few years. This decision was made after the teen's defense team blamed what he did on his childhood and background. The defense asked that Griego was only sentenced as a juvenile to get psychiatric treatment, saying he was an isolated, homeschooled child with a history of trauma. Nehemiah was not allowed to go to school. Uh, he was not allowed to have friends outside of the church. And he was not allowed to grow up in a social or emotionally healthy type of uh, situation. After a lot of backlash, the state ended up appealing the decision that the court made that would allow Nehemiah to be released after just a few years. This meant that he would have to face a judge again in August of 2019 and convince her that he could be trusted if he was given a second chance at life. Griego's defense attorney says he's been through extensive counseling while here at the Juvenile Services Center, but his sister says that's just not enough to change him for the better. While in court, he apologized to his two surviving siblings. These were his two adult siblings who had already moved out of the home on the night that the murders happened. He told them he was sorry that he stole their family from them. I'm sorry for taking our parents and our sins. You know, I wish I could take it back. Reality is that we can't. I want no retaliation. I love you guys, and I want to see the best for y'all. And whatever you may do, and I do pray for you guys to have healing the way I'm having healing. Nehemiah also addressed his aunt and uncle who were in the courtroom. He's ever shown me that kind of mercy and that kind of compassion the way you guys have. And I'm so damn 
grateful for you guys. Nehemiah's aunt and uncle were the only ones from his entire extended family that believed that he deserved to be released from jail at 21 years old. The rest wanted him to stay locked up right where he was. I don't think five years is enough for anyone, whether it's him or anybody else. I mean, he took five lives and that's kind of a lot to deal with just mentally. While addressing his uncle, Nehemiah said something that made his older sister extremely upset. It made her so mad that she actually stormed out of the courtroom because she believed it was disrespectful to her deceased dad. He's been a second father to me. The father I wish I had. Nehemiah then addressed the judge and told her that despite everything that he had done, he still believed that he could become a better person if she agreed to give him just one more chance. Even the worst of us can make progress. Even the ones who've been through hell and back can still make it. While in court, the judge also heard from Nehemiah's surviving siblings who expressed the survivor's guilt they experienced for being able to live on while the rest of their family members were dead. Why do I get to have a life and they don't? No matter how much I want to hate Nehemiah, I know I can't because of my dad. Riego's surviving siblings giving some powerful testimony at sentencing last month. Even some of the detectives who had to work on the case gave their own victim impact statement in court. They said that the incredibly gruesome images that they were forced to see as a result of investigating these gory murders were burned into their brains forever. Detectives in court saying the case could haunt them for the rest of their lives. As a homicide detective, I'd seen many death scenes, but this is the one I get to relive every day. The district attorney's office says they are pleased with the result and thank the attorney general's office for its support through the lengthy appeal process. But at the end of the day, it was the judge who would be making the final decision. In the end, not even Griego himself could convince the judge he deserved another chance. It was not the decision that Nehemiah had hoped for. Life with the possibility of parole. That's what a judge decided. For prosecutors, it's a big win, but for those who were hoping Nehemiah Griego would get a second chance at living a normal life, well, we now know he will spend the better part of, if not the rest of his life, behind bars. Instead of getting out of prison at the age of 21, Nehemiah will now be staying locked up behind bars until he is at least in his 50s. And after 17 days, the judge sentenced Griego to 30 years for each murder of his siblings, ages nine, five, and two years old, and seven years each for killing his mom and dad. All these sentences run concurrently. Griego, now 22 years old, will get credit for time served. He won't be eligible for parole until he's 52. This was a decision that devastated one young woman who is apparently planning to continue her relationship with him, even though he will be staying behind bars. Griego's girlfriend is heartbroken. She texted me saying she loves Nehemiah and that the sentence does not change her love for him. But as for Nehemiah's oldest sister, this young man is staying where he needs to be. In the meantime, she is continuing to work through her own guilt as she wonders if there were red flags that she missed. Me, I never really saw any signs because I thought he was just a rebellious teenager that wanted to do whatever he wanted to, just didn't, didn't care to listen to authority, you know, he just wanted to do his own thing. But at the end of the day, we know that there probably was not anything that she could have done to stop this horrific tragedy. I was my brother, you know, and then for me, I always kind of feel like, you know, why did I see that coming? Why didn't I know something was up with him? Why didn't I ever, you know, notice the signs, I guess? Do you think that Nehemiah deserves the new sentence he received? Could his strict upbringing be any sort of excuse for the five lives he brutally stole? Let us know what you think in the comments. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to like and subscribe for more.